They talk about the border between India and Pakistan as being the most dangerous border in the whole world. So we saw a lot of companies, and these companies are very important in terms of different sectors, different things, to try and weave together a picture of the country, wide range of interest, industries. The feature of them, besides the fact they were impressive, like the politicians as well, they, they spoke a good story, was the focus on growth outside of India. You know, it's interesting, we spoke to Brazil and we said to him, are you going to expand outside the borders of the country? He said, absolutely not. I mean, it's all Brazilian, there's 28 different states that speak the same language, but we've got huge growth opportunities within Brazil, we don't need to go out outside. India has even more growth opportunities, even more. Poor people, lots of people, and yet they all want to move outside. There's something about that environment that worries them. This red tape, the corruption, the environment within which they work that said, guys, you need to externalize your business, and we found that very, very interesting. South Africans too have externalized their business, but Chris would argue a very different basis. South African corporates outgrew the borders of the country and needed to move overseas. And the other thing, I was quite taken aback to have a look in terms of the number of Indian companies in South Africa. So the Indians are very involved in this country, quietly, subtly, nicely, but they're, they're a big feature. And in fact, South Africans are a big feature within their country as well. These are some of our major corporates. And look at the dates of their first inception into the country. They've been there a long period of time. In that particular city, two and a half thousand slums. It's eight million people, 40% of the city. They're really important. But this particular Darabi slum is estimated to put up to a billion dollars of output into the economy. That's very powerful. We don't get that sense. And we saw mobile phones, fridges everywhere. And this particular slum utilizes 60% of the city waste. It ends up in the slum. They utilize it to turn into new product that goes out again. I think it's a magnificent message. In terms of corruption, of all those bricks, India was the second most corrupt. Examples of corruption, it's rife. I mean, this is just one example where there's a notional loss of 39 billion US dollars. And then the macroeconomic data is very, very difficult. We're trying to understand unemployment rates. If we look at the official unemployment rate, it falls from 9 to 3 back to 6. Very volatile series. At the same time, we've compl compared that unemployment rate to what the World Bank shows. You can see enormous differences in numbers. And then also the other thing, we saw all these poor people. The point is they don't define that if you're looking for work and you're seeking work and you're begging and you have some income, they're not defined as unemployed. So you have to understand poverty, which is something very different. They describe their poverty level in India as below $1.50 a day. 50 cents, so half a dollar a day, 30% of the population or 367 million people are below that line. International poverty lines give you numbers closer to 400 million. So they may have no unemployment, they have a lot of poor people. Education though was amazing, very bookish learning, they learn off road. MBAs and more and lots of degrees, but actually the kids have a bit of issue getting jobs when they come out. And then we had a look at engineering, because I think engineering, we are gonna save this very complicated world, facing multiple challenges climate change and other ones. We're going to need engineers, maths and science people to do that. And this is the production. Look how many, almost 900,000 engineers pr produced in, in China. A lot more than the United States of America. Admittedly, a bigger population. But India does well. And they're finding the stock market just very interesting. Look in terms of total number of listed shares. More listed shares in the Bombay stock market than anywhere else in the world. There are more shares that have gone up tenfold or more in the Bombay stock market than the nearest competitor. 750 in the last 10 years versus 72 in the next country, uh, South Korea. But actually in terms of trade and tradability, India's stock market doesn't trade very highly. So, and, and we heard, for example, you can't short sell in the country, et cetera, et cetera. There are some limitations. The top down versus bottom up differ greatly. As a stock picker, it's the country you want to go to. If I had to set up an office in only one country for stock picking opportunity, that's where you want to go. And the final thing is who's going to be the next global superpower? You have two huge countries with India, the world's largest democracy, standing against China, the world's largest communist state, and within 10 years, India has a bigger population. And remember, both of them are competing in the scramble for Africa. There's huge implications for us and who we align with and how we play this whole BRICS thing.